So, what I would like to talk about today is, am I, am I coming through on the sound okay? Very good. Yep. So, what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about textual variants. Now, there's a lot of arguments about the Bible saying that the Bible can't be trusted because the Bible's been changed. And when people make this kind of claim, this kind of statement, they often conflate three separate categories. The category of translation, the category of canon, and the category of textual variant. And what I want to zoom in on today is just the category of textual variants, and that is all. Because the vast majority of textual variants, we have over 400,000, 500,000 textual variants amongst the 5,000 Greek manuscripts, the 20,000 Latin manuscripts, and the 5,000 manuscripts that are translated into Ethiopic, Coptic, Syriac, um, uh, amongst many, many other languages. Now, this kind of um, this kind of glut of manuscript evidence is actually um, an embarrassment of riches, Dr. Daniel Wallace called it, in terms of us establishing what was actually written by the original authors. By comparison, every other ancient text of antiquity doesn't have anything like the material that we have for the New Testament manuscripts. Now, Bearing in mind there's only 133,000 words in the entirety of the New Testament. If we have over 400,000 um, textual variants, then that's telling you that there is about three variants per word. Now, that basically can be summed up as, as spelling mistakes or spelling differences. Some scribes would spell the same word three different times in the same manuscript, in three different ways. It's like, how do you spell John? J-O-H-N-J-O-N-N-J-O-N-H-J-O-N. I mean, there you've got a multiple different ways of spelling John, but they'd all be translated the same. So the vast majority of textual variances in the New Testament can't even be translated. The, the remainder fall into two categories. They fall into the category of um, translatable but non-viable and translatable and viable. So let me give you an example of, of something that was translatable but non-viable. If, if someone wrote a text saying that JC was a member of the Christian Union at, at university and then people copied that text down through history, and then someone, some scribe, wrote JC was a member of the Christian Union at university, it wouldn't take a man of great genius to recognise that there was such a thing as a Christian Union, but there's no such thing as a Christian Union. So one of those is a translatable and viable option, where the other one is simply translatable but non-viable. What I'm going to look at here are all translatable, viable textual variants in the New Testament. And the reason why I want to do that is to show you why Dr. Bart Ehrman, a chief critic of Christianity, an apostate from the Christian faith, um, states on record, uh, and has stated on record numerous times, that textual variants do not impact any essential Christian doctrine at all. And I'm going to demonstrate why Dr. Bart Ehrman says that. So, we're going to read through just the first chapter of Mark. And we're going to note down the textual, uh, viable, translatable variants. So, starting from verse 1. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, textual variant, the Son of God. Now... Think about it. If we take that phrase out, the Son of God, can I use the, the New Testament to establish that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Of course I can. He's called the Son of God in countless other places. And so this is clearly not something that impacts an essential Christian doctrine. Let's carry on. Verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, 
That's a textual variant in the prophets. That could also be translated as um, in the prophets. Ah, sorry. My apologies. Textual variant as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Other ways that other textual variants have it as um, in the prophets. Now, if you put in the prophets there, well, does Isaiah count as one of those prophets? Well, yes, he does. So again, no essential Christian doctrine is impacted by this textual variant. Verse 4 of chapter 1 begins with a textual variant. John the baptizer appeared. In other ancient manuscripts, it just reads, John was baptizing. So whether it says John the baptizer appeared or John was baptizing, that has a, a very minor nuance impact to the text in the sense of it talks about when John first appeared, but it then goes on to say in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, or whether it just simply says that John was baptizing in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So there's no great difference between these two textual variants. They mean and teach exactly the same thing. No doctrine is impacted. If we skirt along in the chapter uh, of 1 of Mark, in verse uh, 14 we read, Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news, textual variant of God, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Now, the textual variant there in this verse is uh, read as of the kingdom of God. So other, other manuscripts read it as proclaiming the good news of the, king, of the, king, of the kingdom of God. Now, whether it says the kingdom of God or simply as it reads in others, of the kingdom. Well, the kingdom that is being described all the way through the Gospel of Mark is the kingdom of God, and so it amounts to the same thing. You've got a textual variant in the Gospel, and it counts for nothing at all in terms of Christian doctrine. And at this point, I want to point out to you something that we've said many, many times, and that particularly Muslims don't understand, which is that the wording of the text for the Christian is not as important as the message. And if the message is sound, if the doctrine is sound and clearly unchanged, then textual variants don't matter a thing. Let's go on and look at another example. In verse 29 we read, As soon as, textual variant, they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now, the textual variant there is could also be read as, um, let's have a look, simply he. So, as soon as he left the synagogue, he entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. So, you've got a textual variant. But the they of the textual variant is including Jesus, the, the most significant figure of the group. And the te other textual variant is saying he, speaking about Jesus, who is the most significant figure of the group. And so this textual variant, and I'm sorry, I slightly uh, doubled up on something that I shouldn't have. The sentence should read in the textual variant B, as soon as he left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, not he. So that means that even when it says he, it's still referring to he as being part of a group, they, that enter the house. So you've got a textual variant that counts for absolutely nothing at all. Now, there are other textual variants that we want to talk about. So, for instance, if we look at, if we go on to verse 40, it reads, a leper came to him, begging him, and, textual variant, kneeling, he asked to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. 
Now, the textual variant there can simply read without the kneeling. So a leper came to him, begging him, and he said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Now that has an impact on the, the picture. Was he kneeling or wasn't he kneeling? If the text is silent about him kneeling, he still could be kneeling. But that doesn't mean that he is. But the Christian faith isn't going to collapse upon the detail of whether the petitioner, the leper, was kneeling or not when he petitions Jesus for his mercy. In verse 41, it says, Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and he said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Now, be moved with textual variant, pity, is, is the textual variant. That textual variant could also be read in other manuscripts as moved with anger. Now, this is one of the most impactful textual variants of this chapter. Was Jesus the Christ moved with pity or was Jesus the Christ moved with anger? It does make a difference, but it doesn't make a difference to any essential doctrine of the Christian faith. We would point to the emotions of Christ as an example of the fact that he was fully human, that he had fully human emotions. So whether that emotion is pity or whether that emotion is anger, the textual variant, whilst having a localised nuance upon the particular meaning of the verse, doesn't compromise any Christian doctrine. So we've just gone through a host of textual variants in the first chapter of Mark, and there are others that I could go to, but I'm not going to. And I've demonstrated to you that these textual variants make no impact upon Christian doctrine. So all of you Muslims who are going on about textual variants, damaging the Christian faith, that it's proof that we can't trust the Bible, you've totally misunderstood what it is we Christians believe about the Bible. The Bible contains the message of God, it contains the words of men. The words of men capture the message of God, what God has done in history, what God, who God is, how God wants us to live. Now, if it is your logic that these textual variants destroy the Christian faith, then it is only fair that as Christians, we look at textual variants inside of the Quran. And I have a list of them here. So let me just get my uh, Quran out. One sec uh, let me just get my uh, phone out. We'll pull up the Quran and we'll look at some textual variants inside of the Quran. Now remember guys, your argument is that textual variants demonstrate that the Bible cannot be trusted and I've demonstrated to you by using textual variants that no essential Christian doctrine is damaged by any textual variant. However, as Muslims, you believe that the Quran itself, that the, the Quran itself is from Allah, that he has preserved the book, that he guards the book, that he watches over the book. So let us look at some textual variants inside of this Quran. Just want to pull up a, I'll tell you which translation I'm getting them from. So I'm getting them from Fadil Soliman's Bridges translation. That's the translation that I'm using and I'm using it because it notifies all of the textual variants between the different recitations of the Quran. Hafs, Wash, Duri, etc, etc, etc because we know in Islamic mathematics, one plus one plus one plus one up to seven equals one. Let's look at Surah 1, Ayah 4. Now, it reads in the Hafs version, Master of the Day of Recompense. However, in other Kirat, 
This is what the, the notation reads. All except for Asim and Al Kasai, Yakub and Kalaf, in one of his narrations, read it as King of the Day of Recompense. Now that's a textual variant between different Qurans, between different texts of the Quran. Some say master, some say king. Now, is the whole of the Islamic doctrine going to collapse on the basis of this textual variant? No. But does it dismiss the idea that every Quran in the world is the same? Yes. Does it have a local impact on the meaning of this verse? Yes. Because not every master is a king and not every king is a master. Some translation, some recitations also have it as owner. Now, if we go to Surah 2 and we go to verse 9, what do we read? In the Hafs version, they try to deceive Allah and those who have attained faith, yet they deceive none but themselves, but they are unaware. Now, the notation reads, in other Kirat, Nafi, in Ibn Kathir, and Abu Amri, they read it as, yet they try to deceive. Now that makes a difference. If it reads, yet they deceive none but themselves, then that means that, that they, they have deceived themselves. But if it reads, yet they try to deceive none but themselves, that would, that in some ways could be read as they're not even trying to deceive anyone else but themselves. One of those two texts clearly makes more sense than the other. One of them is ambiguous. Now, obviously, the ambiguous phrase could be quite easily reconciled, but I'm pointing out that a textual variant has local impact upon the text. Another textual variant is in the very next verse in 2.10, which reads in the halves, in their hearts is sickness, so Allah increased their sickness, and for them is a painful punishment on account of how they used to lie. Now, the, the notes read that in other Kirat, in other recitations, in other texts of the Quran, in Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amr, Abu Jafar and Yaqub, they read it as they used to disbelieve. Now that really makes a difference. One of these versions of the Quran is accusing these unbelievers as lying. The other one is saying that they used to disbelieve. Now if you disbelieve, it doesn't necessarily follow that you lie. So you can be sincerely wrong. So these textual variants in the Quran actually make a difference to what is being said. Do they disbelieve or do they lie? Those two statements are not the same thing. And yet we've evidenced the fact that you've got different Qurans saying different things. If we go to Surah 3, verse 143, we read the following. Let's just pull it up. It's quite far on in the text. In verse 143, we read the following in the halves. And most surely you used to wish for death before, before you had encountered it, but now surely seen it as you were beholden. Oh, sorry, I've read the wrong verse. It's 146. Let's do that again. So in the halves, in 146, in 3146, we read, And how many a prophet has had numerous godly people combating alongside him? However, other versions of the Quran, other Kirat, Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amri, and Yaqub read it as, and how many a prophet has had numerous godly people killed 
alongside him. Now, whether the Quran says combating alongside him or killed alongside him makes a difference to the message that is being delivered. Not a huge difference, not a difference that the entirety of Islam is going to collapse tomorrow. This isn't saying suddenly that there's three gods. But what it shows is that there are textual variants in the Quran that make a difference to what is being said. One says combating and one says killing. Not everybody who fights dies, but everybody who is killed is dead by definition. So should it read combating or should it read killed? Did Muhammad mean for his listeners to understand that people fought with the prophets or are they to understand that people died with the prophets? Which is it? Um, because this text is talking about the same thing and describing it differently. Another example is in verse Surah 3, 151. We read this. We will throw terror into the hearts of those who have been denied because they associated with Allah for which he bestowed from on high no authority. Now, other texts of the Quran, other, other versions of the Quran, for instance in Ibn Kathir, Abu Amri and Yaqub, they read, and we will throw terror into the hearts of those who have denied because they associate with Allah for which he sent down no authority. Now, the phrasing here is different. This is much like those textual variants that we read in Mark. They don't really make a difference whether it says bestowed from on high or sent down. But the fact of the matter is it demonstrates a textual variant. A new phrase is introduced between one version of the Quran and another version of the Quran. Now, the, the question that I want to leave you with is if you're saying that differences in text mean that we should abandon our belief in the Bible, well now I've shown you evidence of different texts in the Quran, are you going to abandon your belief in the Quran? Because remember, we Christians believe something different about our Bible to what you believe about your Quran. We believe about the Bible that it contains the message of God written in the words of men. You believe that the Quran is literally the words of God and Allah protects it. So should it have said killed or should it have said combated? Which is it? The fact of the matter is the Quran is saying two different things. These things don't make the same sense. Literally, they don't make the same sense. Furthermore, as Christians, we believe that the Christian community existed before the New Testament was written. You Muslims believe that the, Christ the Islamic community started with the recitation of the Quran. So textual variants of the Quran are a far more fundamental problem for Muslims than textual variants in the Bible are for Christians. So I'll leave you with that point and I'll move on to my next talk.